it's very interesting to hear uh, how the field is progressing. And thanks for inviting me to tell about our recent works. I will tell about um, basically two works uh, here in Cleveland. Somehow more related to Carl ethics, uh, but uh, throughout these works, we construct kinetic theory for spin one particles. And uh, that uh, will be the connecting point of this talk. Um, so, okay. Um, I will firstly brief run through polarization chiral effects. Um, we, we, we heard that enough here. Then I will uh, essentially give a historical perspective of how I came to these uh, questions. And I guess it will be helpful in understanding uh, why I consider some questions and not others. Then I will show um, our first attempt to construct chiral kinetic theory for spin one particles and in general for massless particles of arbitrary spin. Um, and more recent uh, results on Wigner function for photons. And then I will go to some uh, recently suggested measures of um, uh, polarization transport in, uh, in uh, uh, systems of vector massless vector particles. Okay. So, uh, despite we discussed a lot um, uh, real polarizations uh, in uh, hadrons. Uh, however, I'm going to do uh, to, to go to more theoretical question of how, uh, uh, say, quarks uh, get polarized in quark gluon plasma state. So it's uh, more uh, so far more theoretical question. And the idea is very simple. Uh, if you start uh, putting magnetic field or rotate system of uh, charged uh, particles with spin uh, on very general grounds, you expect that they will get polarized. And that's um, uh, essentially. Um, the idea behind the well-known einstein de Haas effect, which was uh, uh, discussed an uh, infinite time ago. So um, these effects are particularly interesting in the context of heavy ions uh, because of the, this, they can be related to something even fancier. So uh, quarks are massless. Uh, However, if you take this general intuition that they can go, get polarized due to magnetic field, for example, what you expect that if you have more uh, right quarks than left quarks, you will get uh, you will get electric current, and if you have more uh, quarks than anti quarks, you will get uh, uh, chirality separation. Uh, two phenomena known as chiral magnetic and chiral separation effect, effects, uh, and these effects are particularly interesting not only by the fact that they are polarization. Effect, but also because of there is um, quite naive way to relate them to uh, chiral anomaly. So these effects are known to be related to chiral anomaly. Here is a very old idea of how this relation can be seen. Uh, in some naive way, uh, you say that uh, uh, I have electric current along magnetic field, which proportional to me five. Uh, I plug it here. On the other hand, I, if I have a background mu five and my uh, chirality is changing, due to anomaly, I have the same uh, power produced on fluid element, and the two things essentially equal. So uh, it's a clue that the magnetic effect is caused by anomaly, and then you can go and read infinite literature uh, where people uh, give different arguments and prove it in different ways. Now, next step, uh, which will be closer to what I'm going to discuss, is rotation. So as I said, uh, forgetting this relation to anomaly, uh, one may expect that this chiral effect is just polarization effect. So uh, now if I start um, rotate my system uh, due to spin orbit coupling, I expect that my spins will get ordered. And there is a well-known Barnard effect from the same old times uh, when uh, Barnard showed uh, that if you rotate uh, a sample, uh, you get magnetization, basically due to polarization of spins. This effect, uh, in quark gluon plasma and other chiral media, uh, if you work a little bit uh, harder, uh, will bring you to something called chiral vertical. Uh, the idea is very simple again. Uh, you rotate system of your particles, spin get polarized, and you get separation of chiralities because of uh, right particles go, say, a long spin and the left against spin. Uh, if you calculate this effect, um, for example, for free fermions, uh, you will find find this answer for a single direct fermion. Um, this part of the effect is argued to be related to the axial anomaly. 
uh, the, like well-known old works uh, by Sonner, Menger, and here like I just advertised our old work where we were trying to understand how it happens that something uh, caused by rotation can be the autonomous. And this guy here with T squared is a little bit less clear. Uh, there are arguments that it's related to gravitational anomaly and some of them quite uh, solid arguments. Uh, but also there are um, suggestions that in fact it should be related to global uh, uh, gravitational anomalies and not to local ones. So there is some discussion and discussion is quite active. So the works appearing you see in recent years. Yeah, and by gravitational, local gravitational anomaly, I mean this guy, that's the axial current of uh, massless uh, fermions uh, violated by RR2. Okay, so essentially here, uh, uh, I can start uh, my own story. So my motivation uh, originally came from attempt to understand what, what happens with this T squared omega effect first. And second, if this is so general polarization effect, um, why not to try to, to look at uh, some other realization? For example, for photons. And uh, indeed in 2017, uh, with Artur, we uh, looked at um, uh, response of um, thermal bath of photons uh, to rotation. We took a uh, cube formula for Carl Worsicle effect, which was lo long ago suggested by uh, Carl Einsteiner, and just calculated the response in uh, uh, churn current. Uh, this current is not ideal, it's uh, clearly gauge dependent. However, it's related to nice uh, gauge invariant uh, charge. So if you take K0 and integrate it by full volume, you get gauge invariant charge. Um, and we found that this answer quite exp like, uh, well expected. It's this answer is not zero. And it's proportional to angular velocity, temperature squared just, just by dimensionality and some coefficient. So now you can ask uh, a lot of nice questions. First of all, uh, clear that uh, as long as you look at the chiral effects as polarization effects, uh, you expect them to arise for any massless uh, particles with spin. Then you can ask, uh, what, uh, why uh, chiral vertical effect for ferments can uh, sought to be anomalous and say for photons is not anomalous. And if uh, photonic vertical effect is anomalous, what anomaly is it? Then uh, there is a pretty well known uh, discussion of chiral effects in the context of uh, kinetic theory. And in kinetic theory, it's shown that uh, chiral effects are related to the Berry phase. So now one can uh, wonder if uh, uh, photonic uh, chiral optical effect also relates to some topological phase in a semi-classical description of photons. And if the same is true for other masses particles. Then you can try to, as I already said, extend the notion of chiral effects to higher speeds and see how general this phenomenon is and essentially bringing a handle uh, to the problem of their origin because of now, if you say that they arise from something in a, for one spin, you should expect to see a similar behavior for other spin. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we were not really satisfied by uh, the measure we used uh, to illustrate that there is chiral vertical effect of photons. And um, uh, there is a long standing question issue um, which fields have spin but a measure of uh, their speed polarization is uh, uh, gauge non-invariant. So one should uh, work hard to come up with something which is both Lorentz covariant, gauge invariant, local, etc. Also, soon after our work, Naoki wrote a paper where he showed for the first time that the carol vertical effect for photons is related to the Berry phase. Now, uh, let me very briefly run through chiral kinetic theory for uh, chiral fermions first, just to uh, remind you what's going on there. So the idea uh, originally coming from uh, Son and uh, Naoki from 2012 is following. You can write an effective action for, uh, for massless particles. This effective action is a, a well-known and condensed matter and often used uh, as a tool to describe uh, uh, thermodynamics. And this action leads to these equations of motion and this extra sub-leading semi-classical term is the Berry phase. And it enters to the equations of motion as some funny magnetic field in momentum space. 
And this magnetic field uh, has a uh, form of a magnetic monopole, but it's like not real world monopole. This is monopole in momentum space. Now, uh, if you take this theory, you properly disentangle uh, time derivatives, you can write current, just uh, counting how your particles move. And you should be careful because if you need to take into account uh, Jacobian of the transformations of these equations. So, however, that uh, can be like learned from all papers. And I will just show what happens for chiral magnetic effect. So if you have background uh, chemical potential for right and left particles, and this plus minus uh, correspond to different chirals, uh, you will get this answer. So the usual chiral magnetic, magnetic effect arises from this semi-classical description, uh, which is already pretty non-trivial fact. And moreover, if you go in more details of how this uh, coefficient appears here, you will see uh, that it's fixed by the flux of monopole. So uh, in this sense, uh, in this formalism, not yet fully derived, but uh, deduced, uh, chiral effects uh, are intrinsically related to the uh, topological invariants, which are well-known condensed metal and topological invariants of body phase. Now, uh, at the same time, in other work, also working on the question of how to construct Carl kinetic theory by Misha and Yin. Um, they constructed the kinetic theory in a little bit, little bit different way. Uh, however, at the end, it's the same kinetic theory. Uh, they suggested the following trick. Now, let's use something like um, a lot more transformation. Everybody knows that uh, magnetic field and rotation are very similar because Creole's force is very similar to Lorentz force. Uh, the only difference is that uh, they should be different coefficient. And since our particles massless, let's put here the leading part of the energy of a single particle, so absolute value of p. If you plug this magnetic field in the equations, uh, you will get uh, basically the effects of rotation. Uh, you message this system and you get Carroll vertical effect with all uh, correct coefficients. Okay, so even nicer. Now all Carroll effects can be uh, derived in some way from semi-classical description from this uh, uh, naive kinetic theory. Uh, let's uh, see if this approach can be used uh, to understand uh, how uh, chiral vertical effect of photons arise and if it's related to the same thing as chiral vertical effect of fermions. Uh, as I mentioned, it, uh, desirable if you expect that there is a family of effects that they arise in the same way. Uh, approaching this problem from the point of anomalous is harder, clearly, and only recently people started discussing uh, that in some sort of backgrounds, how uh, local gravitational anomaly results in uh, uh, this vertical effect. However, in kinetic theory, uh, it's feasible. And uh, at the very first step, when you start uh, learning literature about kinetic theory for photons, uh, you can find uh, that there is well-known effect, which is called either optical magnus effect or spin hole effect of light. The effect consists in the following: uh, a single uh, uh, a single ray trajectory, or like if you use single particle trajectory, uh, described by this equation. Uh, with this very uh, phase-like term, which is consequence of topological phase of photons of light. Uh, Result in the, the fact that right and left polarizations, uh, circle polarizations, get split. So, and the force here, the effective electric field, uh, in real experiments, so people measure this effect, uh, realized through optical active matter when uh, a force made through wearing uh, diffractive field. Um, refractive field, sorry. Uh, okay. Um, and also notice that. Uh, Despite that for photons, this S, I exactly meant spin will be one. Uh, you can compare what happens with photons with the previous slides where it was one half. So already at this level, there is some clue that you expect that the body phase will be just proportional to the, to the spin in general case of mass spots. So uh, uh, we decided to go further and see if we can uh, do a little bit better. And with Shuguang in 2019, uh, we try to derive this kinetic theory in a different way, uh, trying to avoid, avoid um, deducing the vertical effects, but more like der deriving them. 
There is another way to derive the same kinetic theory, also pretty known in literature. And the way is following. I can write Hamiltonian for uh, my massless particles. The Hamiltonian involves S, where S is spin matrix, uh, which is uh, 2S plus 1 by 2S plus 1 matrix. For spin wall half is just a uh, uh, power matrix, matrix matrices. And for high spins, it's different representations of the same group. And this part is uh, what you expect from a uh, Hamiltonian rotating frame, single particle Hamiltonian rotating frame. Uh, you can write equations of motion, uh, high degree equation of motion, so following from this Hamiltonian. And uh, if you do so, you get this uh, system. Also, one should note that the spin is not completely free object here, so uh, it has extra conditions uh, constraining uh, its, its dynamics. However, I don't want to go too much details of this part because I will, I, I will have better tool to derive the same kinetic theory in a little bit. So I just want to highlight what happens. And uh, if I uh, take these equations and integrate out uh, uh, spin degrees of freedom uh, to leading order energy bar, sub leading order energy bar, energy bar, so first order, I will get equations which are a little bit different from what uh, Son, Naoki, Misha, and Yi got in their works. However, uh, playing with the theory, I will get exactly the same structure of the current, and the answer for the current will be the same if I put their s equal one half. So, um, moreover, as we showed in our work, there is a way to see uh, that it's just ch change of frames from co-moving to uh, static. Uh, so, thus, uh, what I see that the rotating uh, system, uh, there is a general a uh, carry vertical effect for uh, particles of, an, uh, of arbitrary spin. Uh, and this uh, current is current, uh, number current of right minus number current of left. So the unfortunate part of this observation is that I don't know uh, which operator corresponds to this current in field theory. However, I already see that the effect is general and the, that the simple idea from our field theoretical earlier work uh, works well, even. So, okay. Um, now we can uh, sub summarize what happened. Uh, we constructed uh, some naive Carroll kinetic theory for massless particles with spin. We have shown that the uh, Carroll vertical effect is uh, uh, a general phenomenon. Um, now one uh, has to be careful uh, because of if uh, CVs argue to be anomalous or at least part of CV argued to be anomalous for uh, one spin, it should be, it should be uh, anomalous for the other spin. For example, if you say that uh, for spin one half, uh, the well-known part of the chiral vertical effect, which is related to the axial anomaly, is indeed related to the axial anomaly. The same should happen, say, for spin three half, which is definitely a harder system, but uh, statistically interesting uh, thing to check. Okay, and now you also can uh, try to go to a little bit of phenomenology. Carroll kinetic theory uh, for fermions was used as um, some guiding principle to study a polarization phenomena for quarks and uh, to construct some uh, phenological models uh, to say what happens with spin degrees of freedom in quark and plasma. Now we can go further and try to do the same for photons and gluons. And uh, it's interesting. You can ask how strong these effects are. You can ask whether you can understand uh, really what happens with spin degrees of freedom between uh, QGP and uh, uh, Hadron gas, uh, because of now you can try to really follow all degrees, spin degrees of freedom. And if you count, uh, there are about the same number of uh, gluonic spin degrees of freedom as of uh, fermionic degrees of freedom scaled with uh, spin. Okay. Now we weren't completely satisfied uh, by these results because of it's still uh, very some classical descriptions. Uh, anyone working on uh, more formal field theory um, can be unsatisfied by such approach. It's interesting to see whether there is a way to get the same kinetic theory and the same results from uh, field theoretical approach. And recently we uh, went for that with uh, my collaborators and we tried to radialize this kinetic theory using Wigner function formalism. And we, so we introduced the gauge-dependent Wigner function. It's, uh, it was discussed in literature in past. 
uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't put some of rails, but you can look at old works by Ulrich uh, Heinz, Miklos Gulasse, and uh, others. Uh, they were tempting to go to the gauge invariant uh, Wigner function, which made of f mu f alpha beta. However, for our purpose, it was more convenient to work with gauge and non invariant Wigner function. So this Wigner function should satisfy classical equations uh, for uh, gauge fields. Uh, so you, I fix a Lorentz gauge, which is uh, probably the simplest choice you can do if you try to stay covariant. Uh, then uh, acting on one or other index of the coordinate index of the Wigner function, you can get uh, two equations and combining them, you will get two parts. This equation looks pretty similar to Boltzmann equation. Nice. And this equation is uh, what you expect from uh, uh, all other particles, say for scalars, you also would expect that it's p squared uh, Wigner function at leading coordinate. Now, uh, the gauge constraint gives you something else. Uh, and this something else looks like two equations. I wrote only one, but you can easily understand that if I act by alpha on the other index and change sign, th th this equation should be also satisfied. Now, that's not the whole story. Uh, if you uh, start reading uh, textbooks, like uh, high school textbooks on uh, uh, electrodynamics, uh, there is uh, standard statement that uh, Maxwell equations without uh, sources have uh, extra freedom. They have residual gauge freedom. Uh, for example, you can simultaneously fix uh, A0 to be zero with uh, uh, Lorentz gauge, going to column gauge. And uh, trying to be a little bit more general, we introduce some n. It's a time-like vector which uh, normalized to be n squared equal minus one, or one depending on, your, on the signature. Uh, and which supposed to kill uh, a if I multiply it by a, by f. Uh, one thing which we did for simplification of our consideration, we assume that n is constant. However, there is nothing about in introducing non-local uh, gauge fixing constraint, which will be x dependent. Uh, okay, uh, the physical meaning of n will be become clear later. So let's go further. Uh, we will follow uh, the works on the Wigner function for fermions, which were discussed here uh, several times. Uh, and we will try to solve for Wigner function order by order in semi classical expansion, so expanding on h bar. Uh, at zero order, the equations of motion look like that. That's the two equations of motion, and that's the two constants. Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, these equations are too. Uh, not too restrictive. So it's hard to fix the full structure of uh, uh, Wigner function. So we have to take some answers. And since we will be interested uh, in equilibrium case for this particular work, uh, we take simplest possible answers uh, where we introduce uh, project operator, which projects uh, in the direction transverse to P uh, due to this equation and transverse to M due to this equation. And then we enter basically keep structure of uh, what will happen with free photons. Uh, still assuming that the distribution function or what will take place of distribution function uh, can depend on P and X. However, it should be careful to it's, it's an answer at the moment. Okay. Uh, now, uh, at the first order, we already can go further because of the fixed zeros order, uh, the, the equations are more restrictive. So the equations look still the same. Constraints are a little bit uglier. Um, but uh, you can uh, easily uh, simplify them if you split the Wigner function at first order into symmetric and anti-symmetric part. As uh, become obvious later, symmetric part doesn't contribute to polarization effect. So I will just ignore it from now on. However, one can easily go and uh, study what um, happens with the symmetric part and the constraints that turn on them. Up to some extent. Um, and this symmetric part uh, has to follow this equation. And uh, the constraint that uh, WA uh, alpha and alpha equals zero. Uh, the general solution for this uh, Wigner function, for this part of Wigner function of first order, looks like that. Uh, a little bit messy. Uh, however, pretty nice. It has only one free function here. Also, people working with spins can start recognizing some uh, parts of uh, things arising in kinetic scene, but I will leave it for a couple of slides. Uh, 
So this free function u uh, is a problem. So uh, we have to not only take ansatz for zeros order with more function, we have to say something about this here. Um, also, since uh, uh, all physical objects should be gauge independent, the fact that this term explicitly depends on n in a particular way uh, tells that you uh, may want to fix at least part of u requiring that the gauge independent things are gauge independent. To do so, uh, we uh, take a look at the gauge invariant uh, Wiener function defined like that. And if you plug gauge non invariant Wiener function into the definition of gauge invariant Wiener function, you will figure out that the uh, free function can be a little bit fixed. So it has free part, which is n independent, and has fixed part, which has this form. Okay, with this in hand, uh, we can go further. Uh, and try to understand what to do next. Uh, the fifth function is constructed. Nice. Uh, however, it's not fully constrained. There is still free function, but at least it's gauge independent. So it's uh, something we can try to fix from uh, uh, some expression rates. Not ideal, but something. Also, we definitely know from now on working in uh, global equilibrium. Um, now we can. Uh, so now we can try to go further, but um, to do that, to constrain to u zero from some uh, expectation value, uh, since it comes with this epsilon, one may expect that it will contribute to the polarization apparatus. So to the apparatus related to the spin separation, to the separation of polarizations in photon gas. So uh, it will be nice to come up with an observable which uh, we should look at. And uh, here I will go to some very recent uh, discussion. Um, there is um, something called zilch, uh, and zilch is an object which uh, is a non-canonical measure of uh, photon uh, polarization current. And uh, the name is very nice. In English, it means nothing. And uh, why it's called nothing? Because of uh, Lipkin, when he came up with the idea of zilch in 64, uh, didn't find application for this current. So he decided to call it uh, essentially useless. But it's not so useless. So this Zilch current um, uh, does follow. If you look at the uh, usual uh, helicity current for like a Chen Simons current, it's zero's component uh, counted mod by mod for uh, the gauge field, basically counts the number of right minus number of left. However, so now the Zilch current, if you do the same thing and look closer at its structure, count weighted difference between number of right and number of left. But it gives gauge invariant measure uh, of the, the helicity separation. So it's not canonical object, object, so it's not very uh, natural from field theory point of view. On the other hand, it's uh, pretty convenient uh, to discuss the process in a physical way. Moreover, this Zilch current uh, is not unique, but it will come uh, to that in, uh, later. There is a whole tower of Zilch currents. Uh, but first, I want to notice that um, uh, Maxim Chernadub, Karl, and the uh, collaborators uh, showed that there is a chiral vertical effect in Zilch current, uh, which takes place in the same setup as chiral vertical effect for photons. So one may expect that the two effects are related and try to see. Uh, well, like try to take uh, to, to look at the polarization phenomena in uh, rotating system of massless particles of higher spin using zilch. Okay, uh, now going one, one step back, the zilch current is not uh, alone. There is a family of zilch currents, and they have some freedom. Uh, and one of choices uh, which can be made is symmetric zilch current. This object is fully symmetric in uh, indices. And this centralization divides them by one over s uh, factorial. And the two way derivatives is the usual two way derivative is one half. So this object can serve for free uh, Maxwell theory. One can check it. And uh, now uh, it's pretty convenient because it has uh, some uh, Lorentz properties, its symmetric structure. One can try to guess it in kinetic theory. So uh, why I want to do that? Because if I want to know what to compare to uh, when I will plug there my Wigner function. Um, so in kinetic theory, I will expect that this Zilch current will take this form. 
Why is this form? Uh, because of uh, the only two vectors, uh, covariant vectors I expect in my theory is J and P. And uh, I don't expect to have more than one power of J. So I have to fill uh, all three slots of uh, dimensionality uh, by P's. So I take this object uh, and start studying it. Uh, first, I want to make uh, some uh, step, uh, step back in history and uh, remind those who don't recall about side jumps. In kinetic theory, Carl kinetic theory, there is an interesting uh, discussion, an interesting story, that if you try to introduce um, uh, spin, uh, spin degrees, like separately consider spin degrees of freedom of four massless particles, you have an issue. Uh, there is no uh, Enough const there are no enough constraints to fix uh, a spin unique. Even if you require that p mu s mu equals zero, you need to require something else. Uh, so, uh, also of this work uh, suggested to just fix uh, freedom by uh, putting something called frame vector and mu. And, and, Andrei, uh, Andrei, uh, uh, just sorry, just for information, uh, uh, the time of your talk is over, but. Uh, Please continue. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, OK, I, I can go a little bit faster. Um, anyway, uh, this NMU is not uh, like, you know, it's called N by, by reason. So um, now to introduce, uh, like, OK, with this S mu, uh, S mu is fixed uniquely, but depends on N. And since you want physical quantities not to be N dependent, uh, you have to modify current, and the current will look like that. And if you uh, play with it a little bit, you will get the structure for the leading part of the current. And play, you can it the guest uh, form of the Zilch current, you will get this answer. So now I'm ready to go to the Wigner function and try to see if I can uh, constrain the Wigner function by uh, this expression value. Okay, the Wigner function has a free part, and I will plug it uh, into this definition of Zilch current. I will get this answer. So this structure here should be compared with the uh, current. So with this structure here, and you already can recognize that this epsilon p n over p dot n, very similar to s mu. And since uh, just by naming, f is expected to be a distribution function, and that's already very close to what I expect from kinetic theory. And indeed, if I require that u zero equals zero, I get the very same answer uh, using Wigner function. So basically, uh, pushing u zero equals zero, I reproduced my kinetic theory uh, at the level of uh, expression values. Because of, if I plug just to the current uh, defined uh, in a simple way, I will get the same structure as in kinetic theory. Moreover, we reproduce in our work uh, the same calculation uh, counting uh, Zilch current mode, mode by mode in, photon, in rotating photon radiation uh, and found the same answer. So it's also reproduced from a simple field theory with no reference to kinetic theory or semi classical experiment. Okay, nice. Uh, so uh, let's go to the outlet. What happened? We constructed an AF kinetic theory for particles of an, of an arbitrary spin. Uh, in the case of photons, uh, we managed to show that this kinetic theory indeed works, uh, at least for some uh, observables uh, from the Wigner function formalism. And we constructed Wigner function for photons. Uh, and uh, we shown that the frame vector for photons introduced in kinetic theory uh, as an, um, some extra entity with no simple physical meaning is in fact residual gauge uh, fixing parameter. Now one can go back and look at Fermi's and ask what uh, physical meaning it has for Fermi's. Uh, for chiral effects, we've shown that the CV place for arbitrary spin. It originates in a very phase for any spin. So we have one index uh, for CV already. It's S, let's call it S. And then for infinite tower of Zilch, we showed uh, that the Zilch also relates to the body phase and in this way related to, to CV. So one can see that there is a, a rising family of chiral effects, which has two indices, one index for spin of particle and the other for number of indices of the object, so for the spin of the object. Uh, it's not yet shown, but uh, Pavel and the uh, co-authors now, uh, I, I believe, already sh showed that there is a uh, uh, zilch, zilch vertical effect for fermions. Uh, 
um, then one can try to go and see, uh, at least from kinetic theory, that is a zilch particle effect for arbitrary spin, and uh, it's done. Okay. Uh, so there is some background uh, developed here to study the polarization phenomena in rotating plasma. Uh, still, with problems because of Gaussian variant measure, uh, for example, uh, is not well, like very well applied to interacting systems. The zilch is not conserved on interacting systems. However, it gives some hints uh, how to pass it further. And uh, I will stop here with uh, questions for future. There is a large family of current vertical effects as anomalous. Um, can the Wigner function uh, for gauge fields be constructed in a more clear way? As you saw, I fixed part of Wigner function uh, from expectation value uh, for, say, one of uh, uh, Zilch, and then shown that the whole tower of Zilch is reproduced. However, one can try to do that better. And for massive particles, for massive effective particles, it's even harder because there are more structures there. So it's interesting how much Wigner function can be constrained. Then one can go and try to speculate if uh, constructing hydrodynamics with spin uh, from different Wigner functions for spin one half and spin one, uh, one can further constrain its structure. Because of one, I, I, I guess this statement is close to be correct that uh, the spin hydrodynamics shouldn't care much about what it's made of. So it will be interesting to see uh, what happens if you uh, do it in parallel for ferments and uh, for some massive vector particles. Uh, and finally, uh, it's uh, an interesting new step in uh, this old problem of studying the uh, polarization of gauge fields. And uh, one can try now try to extend uh, the results towards interacting systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it was very interesting. So are there questions? So uh, Masaru, Ongo, please. Hi, Andre. Thank you very much for a nice talk. And uh, I have an question about uh, uh, Zurich current. And uh, I thought the Zurich current is, uh, uh, how to say, coming from the infinite tower of the conservation, conserved uh, quantity in the Maxwell theory, free Maxwell theory. And uh, if, if you consider the dynamic, uh, Couple of that, how to say QED? Uh, I mean that if you consider the charge of fermion or scalar uh, matter sector, so th this current is uh, have the same uh, oh, yeah, yeah. remains. That's, yeah, yeah, I understand. It. That's a very good question. I don't know answer. Also, probably I didn't stress that enough. So here for Zilch, I'm definitely working for free Maxwell series. So I have just a tank of photons, and I trying to hide problems of how they interact with what. It's a very interesting question whether there is a good measure of polarization. Uh, current for photons in interacting theory. And there is no yet clear answer in Yiddish. So Zilch is stepped forward, but not yet the answer. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Yeah, you asked me the very right question. Yeah, it's something next what should be done. Okay. Uh, Francesco, please. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make some to to. So to uh, to say, to comment about the last questions, the last question. So the the last uh, or the first question in the conclusion. Yeah. Okay. So there are, there is a large family of chiral vertical effects are the anomalous. Since um, I mean I'm I'm very I'm very happy that you made this for uh, spin one uh, or for uh, say for photons because uh, three years ago uh, we uh, Matteo Buzzegol and I. Uh, claimed that the formula with re which relates the axial current to the to the um, to the vorticity, which is called either chiral vertical effect or axial vertical effect, depending on the author. Say, uh, say I think the chairman the chairman likes better axial vertical effect. So this is, and we we claim that th this has nothing to do with anomaly. Yeah, the reason, yes. The reason being. That so in a, in a sense the the answer to the question is no. Uh, I mean uh, the, this is in my in my view, because that you can recover this as you showed for three particles. Okay, so you just turn off the interactions and still if you have a rotating system and you maximize the entropy, you have the J mu a is proportional to omega through the coefficients involved in t squared t square and and uh, and omega square. 
sorry, and mu squared. Therefore, uh, therefore, the, the, and this is simply because when you have uh, a rotating system, an axial current can be there. It is allowed by the symmetry. Therefore, it is even a classical level. So we uh, pointed out that, uh, so we questioned the idea that this, uh, this axial vertical effect or current vertical effect, you name it, is, uh, is, is not anomalous. Yes. Uh, actually, then, just, uh, but we had we had a very harsh discussion with the referees about this. So I don't know uh, why the problem that you so the question that you um, raised has not been raised before. And uh, I am very say glad that you uh, that you say um, uh, put these questions at, a, at one of the first points in your conclusions. Yeah, Francesca, I should say that I in a sense was motivated by. Uh, you too. I mean, this discussion uh, uh, appeared from several uh, different uh, uh, discussions, personal discussions with people. So one of them is uh, your like your talk about this uh, thing, and um, let me let me try to explain that in a short way. So uh, there are two statements. One, you uh, said that it's not anomalous, and I was trying to understand why it's uh, it looks like anomalous. In other contexts, so I was interested because I was coming from the point of view of it's anomalous. On the other hand, long time ago, Valentin Zaharov, who was my uh, first supervisor in undergrad, um, mentioned me that there is anomaly, gravitational anomaly for photons. So uh, there is interesting uh, situation. So on the one hand, when as long as I talk about this, let's find this guy somewhere. Yeah, sorry, I need to find this guy. Yeah, so as long as I talk about this part, yeah, let's for a second forget this part. But as long as I talk about this part, uh, for Fermions, there is a work by Carl, um, which suggests it's anomalous uh, and coming from gravitational anomaly in uh, Hello. And then there are recent works, say, by uh, Michael Stone uh, and by Valentin, uh, Alec, uh, and George and uh, by many others, by Kenji, uh, the works which show how it may be related to gravitational anomaly. So it looks like, again, anomalous in a particular way. And the fact that you see it as non-anomalous, it's uh, an interesting connecting pole. So anomaly, anomalous like, you know, like Cheshire cat smile. They are here, but not here. On the other hand, when you go to photons, the question gets clearer because of now you have to find the anomaly for photons. Curiously, there is anomaly of the same type for photons. Gravitational anomaly for photons. I should have shown uh, this anomaly. Yeah, so this anomaly here, sorry for showing only here, uh, can be written also for photons if you put the here as a, a proper measure of uh, polarization current for photons. So it will be exactly the same form, RR dot, with different condition. And uh, that gives a clue that it still may be anomalous. But then you need to go further and figure out what, what anomalies uh, take this place for say spin three half or like spin two. So it's interesting. So, but and I, can, can I ask a question then? Okay, can I ask a question, Chairman? I, I, I guess you can ask a question, yeah. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> the question is, the question is the, uh, so how can, so, why why should be related to a gravitational anomaly if there is no so if the Riemann tensor does not appear here so I mean oh yeah that's that's uh, maybe awesome. this is a naive question maybe this is a very naive question but you know no no Francesca yeah. it's a very right question uh, okay I can tell you my best guess my best guess that it's uh, it may come through non-trivial theoretical relation uh, through some conformal. Uh, um, uh, Word identities, but uh, it's still very far. Yeah, so it's very nice uh, that this effect arises for different spins because of now there is a handle to property. So in this sense, uh, thanks for uh, noticing that, and I guess it's it's important. It, it it may be helpful to understand the physics behind it. Now, you, actually, your question can be even better if you look at Zilch. So since I showed that all of them arise in the same way, uh, that is the whole family of these Zilch for different spins. And for different spins of zilch, so I can change the number of indices. And in the limiting case of s equal one, 
I will come back to the just current uh, Zilch's anomalous in any way. So we can ask this question even better because of Zilch's are completely new objects, even for Fermans. And nobody studied whether they are anomalous in any sense. Sorry, can I make one comment? And so about the T-square term of the uh, chiral vertical effect, uh, uh, there's a paper written by uh, Gorka and Sechi. Uh, they are discussing the, that, that part is coming from the global anomaly. And, uh, so, and the global anomaly, so, so you have the RR tilde term in your uh, anomaly equation. And that is a perturbative part of the global uh, term, how to say, higher dimensional uh, origin. And uh, if you consider the uh, uh, higher dimensional counterpart of the, this RR to the term, you can and, uh, keep the uh, also the global part of the anomaly, you can immediately obtain this T square term. So there's a, a discussion or the, how to say the origin is maybe the uh, understood yeah. from the uh, concept of the global anomaly. Yeah, that's, well, that's why I said it's still under active discussion. So that is work by Son uh, and Galcar, that is work <coughs> actually by Hong Liu and uh, my uh, MIT friends, uh, which I didn't mention here. Uh, so people related to global anomaly. But now a look at more recent works by Kenji, by Michael, uh, by uh, George and others, where they related to gravitation, local gravitational anomaly. So it's still under discussion. And that's why I guess it's especially interesting. So there are three points of view on this effect. There's a point of view for which Francesca just said, oh, it's just polarization effect. Uh, it has nothing to do with anomalies. And when you try to find relation to anomaly, you're doing something artificial. So you find what you want to find. The point of view by uh, Son and Hong, for example, and other people from uh, effective field series for hydro that, that it comes from global anomalies. And point of view by Michael and uh, Kenji and others uh, that comes uh, from the right uh, local gravitational anomaly if you look at the real gravitational background. So in this sense, I find it's quite exciting that um, there, there are more handles to uh, probe this dynamics, to probe this fact. But, but, no, so, but no. that, that is somehow, yeah, sorry, okay. I, I will, yeah, yeah, so let us discuss the data, so. Okay, there's so a discussion, yeah, that's uh, the, the next question, Kenji. Yes, <laughs> so, uh, Andre, hi. Um, I have actually uh, my own opinion about anomaly, but my question is a much, much simpler, different one. Uh, that's about uh, gauge invariance or your treatment of capital U. Usually in the Coulomb gauge fixing, uh, you should impose a Gauss law. And so my question is, your determination of capital U, is that consistent with uh, imposing the Gauss law? Or uh, it seems to me that you uh, fix this U from some matching with the gauge invariant uh, Wigner function using a uh, field strength tensor. So my question is, uh, why don't you use uh, such a gauge invariant uh, Wigner function to, to begin with? Um, Kendra, uh, good question. Uh, it just appeared to be uh, algebraically simpler to work with this uh, Wigner function to understand the structure. Because okay. of the full FF Wigner function has many theorems, so when you start writing it down, you uh, it's very hard to see, for example, this nice uh, spin, spin theorem structure. When uh -huh. you go here to gauge dependent uh, Wigner function, there are less theorems because there are less indices. Some part fixes completely by equations, and the other part uh, has something uh, to do with kinetic theory, so you start seeing the structure. So you start like, you know, smelling blood. And then when you go further and plug it in, you start seeing that many terms of the full gauge invariant uh, Wigner function disappear. In fact. OK, OK. Yeah, so OK, so, so that, that, that answers my uh, latter part of my question. So my first part of the question is about the Gauss law. So is, so is this, uh, the how to say, consistent with uh, requiring the Gauss law? or? Yes, I, it, it should be, it's, it's free theory. So in free theory- Yes, it should be, but so did you check? That is my question. Uh, let me think. No, I, I didn't think in these terms. We, we, we might ask my collaborators, but I myself didn't think in these terms. I okay. was thinking okay. that I take a uh, Coulomb gauge. So if A mm -hmm. equals zero, A zero equals zero for free yes. uh, photons. Uh, yes. 
and try to calculate in this gauge. Then I realized, oh, this gauge uh, is only one uh, case. So let's try to boost it by constant boost, by n mm -hmm. uh, which seems mm -hmm. to be like, like a pretty well defined gauge. So no problems here. It may be hard to define field theory in this gauge. However, no, like no uh, fundamental problems here. And then I mm -hmm. saw that this n mu uh, related to the frame vector. Mm -hmm. All right, this u0, the u0 part, uh, we had to fix it uh, by comparing with uh, uh, expectation limit. For, mm -hmm. for okay. okay, so the, the Wigner function is the expectation value of some operator that is in terms of a gauge a potential and that uh, state must satisfy the uh, Gauss law. And so you should, uh, in general, insert some uh, projection operator uh, so that the state must satisfy the Gauss law. And so my guess is, Probably a uh, u and u zero are also all, all fixed by such kind of their uh, projection uh, procedure. Uh, that yeah. is my guess. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was yeah. So, yeah, uh, the comment. Uh, sorry, uh, can you, uh, by Gauss law, do you mean the Coulomb gauge? Yes. I, 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 uh, we I, already imposed the Coulomb gauge. I, I, I think Ken demands that we should make an integral constraint. So in the in the quantization procedure, uh, a zero equals zero. Oh, so f f first you put the a zero equals zero, and then so uh, from that condition, uh, what was that uh, primary uh, condition, the secondary condition, the secondary condition is actually the Gauss law. Yes, the constraint system of uh, quantization. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's that's definitely interesting. Yeah, no, it, it reminds me something from textbooks so I need to take a look, but I guess your eyes right, there may be a little bit more uh, ways to constrain the Wigner function. So it would be very nice to get rid of this uh, ad hoc way how as, as we constrained it here. Mm -hmm. Actually, one thing to just to briefly mention since uh, Ken just said it, uh, despite that, I, that, that we use the uh, 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 given operator to constrain to use zero, uh, we can use it as U and S, so one S, so just one of the images. And then mm -hmm. uh, we reproduce the whole tower of the images, which is a nice check. Mm -hmm. Actually, yes. 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 Here, uh, I didn't cite, uh, I guess, work by Carl. Oh, no, actually, I cited. Uh, I cited work by Maxim Chernadup, Carl, Einsteiner, and others. And um, we tried uh, to use the Wigner function for their definition of the chart. And they got the answer there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Alec, please go ahead. Well, thanks. Uh, first, uh, actually, I I wasn't planning to, to to mention anomaly, but because of this interesting discussion, I think I can add that you should uh, distinguish the anomaly as the current non-conservation physical effects uh, pay creation from the uh, anomalous current. Which is, uh, which is not a divergence, but it is also protected and so on. And I think um, uh, concerning the question of Francesco, uh, just gravitational no anomaly clearly uh, manifests this distinction because we start from divergence, but after that we go to the surface term and surface term on the, on the surface of black hole. And this precisely make the derivation. So I think just, uh, gravitational anomaly clearly makes this distinction distinction between divergence and there are no really physical divergence there and uh, boundary term this was my my comment concerning uh, anomaly and could, my another comment is following kenji is related to gauge invariance and in fact you use the uh, type of sort of excel gauge right and in this, this is also used in, in the um, uh, just uh, parameterizing of matrix element, hadronic matrix element. And uh, the extra constraint is so-called uh, N independence, that this uh, vector N can be chosen in different way. And there are some specific equation expressing this N, N independence. And what I suspect that maybe you can have also dependence on N in the scalar product of n dot x, insert the 
in the, inside the functions and maybe write in the and independence equations you may you may just put extra constraint on this on these functions yes this yes. is what i suspect yeah yeah i, I had similar ideas and yes and what, what you as, as i would read or understand what you're saying okay. i could take this and where was it Let me yeah, yeah, but it can be it can be chosen in different way uh, proper uh, you you have normalization and you probably have, well, you had dependence on the p dot n, but you can, in, in principle, n may appear inside the inside the functions. So functions can depend also on n dot x. This this is yeah. Also, what what can be done? N can be made x dependent. Right, so right. Can... This is in front. Yeah, yeah. This is a, just a constraint which you have, but and it is satisfied. But besides that, n can be different, and then you have this. Uh, it's it's uh, applied when uh, dealing with Actually, also with, with uh, polarization uh, in hadronic physics, which is twist, twist free attack. So here it's, it's also oh. may, may appear. Yeah, it's interesting. Yes, definitely we, we, we chose not the most general uh, gauge constraint. <clears throat> so I don't see other, uh, other questions. So thank you, Andre, very much. Very vivid discussion after your talk.